I would like to start uh, our next session, and here's Hakem, um, on, the percep on perceptions and encounters, tracing the history of Armenians and Kurds in Turkey. And our chair is uh, Ron Sunni, who I'm my passing the microphone to. Okay. I'm going to sit here, and I think Ohannis would like to sit. Do you want to stand? You can do whatever you like. You but, with the paper? Yeah. Okay, so more like a seminar here. This panel, we have a sociologist and an anthropologist, both of whom are doing history from their very distinctive disciplinary perspectives. I'll introduce our first speaker, and then uh, after he's finished the second, and then we'll, a few remarks, and then we'll open it up to discussion. Ohanes Kılıç Dağıl, is a graduate of Boazici University and the Ataturk Institute of Modern Turkish History in Istanbul. And I would say that Ohanes is one of a new generation of Ottoman historians. Those many in this room, I'm looking around at Tuche and Zovinar and others. I'm thinking of Richard Andaramyan, our past graduate student uh, now at USC and others still. Uh, one of that new cohort of Ottoman historians who have integrated the history of non-Muslim peoples like Greeks, Jews, Kurds, well, they're Muslim, Armenians, as well as Kurds, into the imperial mosaic of the Ottoman Empire. Instead of treating Ottoman history as if it were a history of a homogeneous nation state of Turks or Muslims, Dr. Kılıç Dağı and others have broadened this picture. And indeed, in some ways, this has been a theme, if you think about uh, uh, some of the remarks in the last panel, of our conference. But this can only be accomplished if a historian like Hohannes knows the languages of the non-Muslims. And he has, in fact, not only Turkish and Ottoman, but, oh, since he's Armenian, <laughs> Armenian as well. <laughs> the picture he drew, both in his master's essay and his dissertation, was of empire as a multinational enterprise in which bourgeois Armenians played an important role. He handles both the archival sources as well as the broader literature and as a historical sociologist, he does what many of us historians forget to do, he actually uses social theory to make broader, more conceptual points about the empirical evidence. He provides one of the best explanations of why the second constitutional period, that is 1908 to 1914 or 18, uh, uh, in this period, the relations between the Armenians, Kurds, and Turks dis deteriorated so rapidly as he looks uh, to an examination of Muslim attitudes and rhetorics about Armenians. He's published a number of articles in Turkish, in English. Uh, he's uh, a book as well on Armenian-Turkish relations and his new project, which I've been privileged to read some articles on, uh, deals very beautifully with periodical, Armenian periodicals in this second uh, constitutional period. I want to thank Ohanes because when I taught uh, in the winter and spring of 2017 at Bilgi University, uh, he was my indispensable friend and colleague. He uh, signed me up so I looked like I was living in his house, which I wasn't. Uh, he helped me get through the bureaucracy of the uh, Turkish government, which wanted a copy of my uh, diploma for some reason. Erdogan doesn't show his diploma, <laughs> but I had to show mine. Uh, and he was always engaged when we had dinners before uh, or any conversations in intellectual enthusiasms, always ready to help. And everyone knew that Ohanes was a valued citizen of that university. So his work is really original and innovative, uh, and he's going to talk to us today uh, about this very uh, uh, fraught subject of land relations, Kurds, and Armenians. Yeah, thank you, Ron. Uh, you are so kind. And first of all, let me thank for all those, including current and former directors of ASP, 
uh, who made ASP possible and also this event possible and for giving me the chance of being uh, such a wonderful community. So, uh, so I'm thankful and grateful. Uh, and today, indeed, I'm going to talk about uh, my research, which uh, I shaped during my fellowship here. Uh, and as you see, the topic or the title is the intercommunal relations and perceptions of Armenians and Kurds before the Armenian genocide. When we say before the Armenian genocide, as Ron says, the context is the second constitutional period of the Ottoman Empire, uh, started in July 1908 when the parliament and uh, elections were restored uh, after uh, 30 years of Hamidian despotism. So uh, at that time, as you know, people or peoples were very ha hopeful about the future. So uh, the things I'm going to talk about uh, was happened in, in, in this context. So let me start with a small anecdote. Almost one and a half years after the restoration of the Ottoman constitution in July 1908, in the Armenian neighborhood of the city of Erzincan in Eastern Anatolia, a group of reportedly drunk Muslims fired their guns. After an Armenian man attempted to intervene and warn them, one of the men in the group, Muslims I mean, Kel Salih, wounded him by gun. When the other people around tried to prevent him from giving more harm, according to newspaper reporting this incident, he shouted, quote, let me kill him as an example, unquote, and he insulted the constitution. Now, some questions pop up. Why did he want to make an example out of an ordinary man on the street? Why did he refer to constitution? What has the constitution to do with an uh, ordinary street fight? And what, di what did the restoration of the constitution change in relations between Armenians and their Kurdish neighbors, if changed anything? So inspired by such questions, my paper will discuss the mutual relations and perceptions of Armenians and Kurdish people in the aforementioned period. And if I have time, I'm going to relay some observations on how the collective memory of each group about the other manifests itself today at the present time. As I said, the, once the tyranny of Abdulhamid II ended, people expected a new era in which the problems and hatred of ancien regime would also disappear. They thought that the future would be more peaceful. Not only, but especially Armenians in the eastern provinces who had been suffering from insecurity of life, property, and honor for decades, hoped to have a sigh of relief. They expected to see the establishment of justice through the compensation and correction of past assaults against them. In not, but uh, many, in many cases, the attackers happened to be Kurdish chieftains or neighboring Kurdish communities in the eastern provinces. Maybe the most noteworthy and complicated problem generating tensions between Armenians and neighboring people during the second constitutional period was land extortions, namely the lands taken from Armenians by force. Surely, this problem had occurred de decades before 1908, but it, far from being solved, was still one of the most salient, important reasons of Armenians' complaints after the 1908 revolution. These disputes cannot be evaluated as sporadic or ordinary judicial cases among individuals because their frequency in time and space point to a systematic and structural problem. The restitution of lands was one of the issues brought to the fore also by Armenian political parties of the time. Both Tashnaks and Hunchaks published declarations to demand the return of seized lands belonging to Armenians. These demands must have been discussed also in Turkish political circles as Jamal Pasha, being one of three most important leaders of the time, 
Jamal Pasha states in his memoirs that before the mutiny of March 31, 1909, the CUP, the ruling party, had intended to form a special commission and send it to the eastern provinces to solve land disputes between Armenians and neighboring communities. However, this attempt faced a harsh opposition from the Muslim deputies, including Kurdish deputies in the parliament. Indeed, whenever Armenian MPs tried to open discussion about this topic in the General Assembly in the parliament, Muslim deputies of eastern provinces formed a block against these attempts in the parliament. Mostly because of this opposition and partially because of the rebellion or mutiny of March 31, the CUP completely shelved the project. And let me underline a common characteristic of these land disputes. And this characteristic is their longevity as some of these disputes had lasted even more than two decades without a final result, just, just lingering in air 20, 25 years. It is unsurprising that this longevity contributed to the persistence and even acceleration of intercommunal tension, given that new generations took over the problem from their fathers. One, may, one might easily say that the land problem was a factor continuously, quote unquote, poisoning intercommunal relations. There are many examples from uh, the Armenian press. There are many anecdotes. But let me just mention one of these cases or anecdotes reported uh, in the contemporary Armenian press. And I think it's an interesting one to show how land problem, quote unquote, poisoned or affected the intercommunal relations. The case is from Pasin, Erzurum. A Kurdish village in Pasin named Sheikh Yusuf had invaded some lands belonging to the neighboring Armenian village called Dodi. After the constitution, I mean the restoration of the constitution, they were supposed to give them back. But, I mean the land, they, uh, but some dark forces, quote unquote, this is the term used by the newspaper, some dark forces tried to provoke the enmity between two villages in order to keep land at the hand of Sheikh Yusuf village. And also, again, this term comes from the newspaper itself, harm the constitutional regime. Someone, the case is that, someone opened the grave of a holy figure respected as a saint by the Kurds of Sheikh Yusuf and took his remaining body parts and in this way violated the sacredness of the grave. The Kurds thought that this was a deliberate hostile action by the Armenians from Dodi. One of the Kurds from Sheikh Yusuf, namely Esad Efendi, led others to complain to the govern governor about it. At the end of the investigation, it was understood that this was a plot organized by Esad Efendi himself in order to increase the tension and enmity between two villages and accordingly prevent the restitution of aforementioned lands taken by Kurds from Armenians. Uh, in addition to land usurpations, other assaults such as robbery of movable properties and livestock, abduction and rape of women and girls, homicide, also increased the intercommunal tension. Almost in every issue of newspapers of the time, there is a bunch of news reporting this kind of attacks against Armenians. There are some examples here in this paper, but I'm going to omit all to save the time. Uh, in some, let me say that perennial problems of land disputes and public security and absence of rule of law continue to exist heavily after the promulgation of constitution as the biggest impediments for peaceful cohabitation of communities. The longer these problems remain unsolved, naturally the more Armenians lost their trust in new constitutional regime. Now, let me turn in this environment what Armenians uh, had, what kind of opinions about Kurds. As I said, in most of the cases, these incidents, uh, in these incidents, Armenians had been clashing with Kurds. 
So the question, what shall we do with Kurds, was a hot question of the time in the Armenian press. In most of the analysis made by the Armenian authors, let me open a parenthesis here. When I say Armenian authors, I mean provincial teachers, uh, college students, editors, or, or some, again, provincial intellectuals, lawyers, this kind of people I'm talking about mainly. Now, in most of the analysis made by the Armenian authors, Kurds are depicted, depicted quote unquote, as semi savage, barbaric, or at best, uneducated people. According to these commentaries, Kurds were still living in a feudal order which did harm not only to themselves, but also Armenians. According to this way of thinking, as long as Kurds continued to live in ignorance and feudalism, Armenians would continue to suffer from them. Therefore, they reason, Armenian commentators suggested to help Kurds in coming out of dark ages. Again, this term belongs to these authors. Which would be eventually beneficial for Armenians and the rest of the country as well. For example, one commentator from Hunas, Erzurum, again, says that the majority of Kurds were so ignorant that they didn't even know reading and writing. Their ignorance was also a risk for the future of constitutional regime, as it was not possible to make un uneducated people understand important political principles and concepts such as constitution, equality, justice, etc. It would be unrealistic, according to these commentaries, to expect them contribute to the development of Ottoman Federland. Therefore, for the benefit of Armenians and the whole country, Kurds should have been educated. Another quotation, quote, give them light, education. Within a decade or two, they, as a brisk and strong race, will be able to contribute to, the, to our fatherland. End of quote. Another author, writing from one, had similar arguments. He claims Kurds were uneducated, ignorant, and accustomed to live through pillage, so they had a natural affinity to sword and blood. As long as they remained uneducated, uncivilized, they would continue killing and plundering Armenians. Moreover, the author claims the encouragement they saw from the tyrant, Abdulhamid, convinced them that peaceful, hardworking people had to feed them for free and for forever. It was unacceptable for Kurdish Aas chieftains that the constitution brought equality for, uh, uh, equality for Christians. In those circumstan circumstances, ordinary Kurds, who were always ready to assault Armenians, were a very suitable tool for those who wanted to continue their despotic rule or sabotage the new regime. The commentator foresees that although some young Turks had sincerely tried to establish the constitutional regime, it wouldn't be possible to entrench this regime on a firm and stable basis unless they considered the problem of the Kurdish enlightenment. He continues, quote, let us educate Kurds, improve their nightly characteristic, eliminate their negative instincts, and try to sow the seed of vir virtue, goodness, and beauty. Then we can be sure that the Kurd, who become decent by heart and soul, will present real services to the fatherland." Unquote. According to many comments in this endeavor of enlightening Kurds, Armenians should have taken a responsibility and helped them out. For example, Armenians could assist them in overcoming illiteracy, which was a major problem among Kurds. As a matter of fact, an Armenian named Hratia, again from Erzurum, prepared a primer to teach Kurds reading Kurdish in Armenian script. This is not an Armenian or Turkish, but you know. And Actually, Har uh, Haraj newspaper in Erzurum would publish and distribute this primer 
in hope of helping the expansion of education among the Kurds and putting them, again in quote, putting them on the way of civilization. Now, let me try to interpret the situation, make uh, some comments about it. Uh, under the light of contemporary texts, the social relations between Armenians and Kurds during the second constitutional period cannot be described as peaceful, harmonious, or easygoing. Although communities celebrate the constitution in euphoria together, hand in hand, structural legal problems taken over from previous generations continue to exist and tense up the intercommunal relations. It is quite clear that these unsolved problems increased the intercommunal tension and amplified negative feelings among Armenians against neighboring communities. Moreover, in conflicts born out of land disputes, for example, the ethnic and religious identity of Armenians easily became a target. In this way, usurpers tried to legitimize their unlawful deeds by emphasizing the cultural difference and inferiority of the victim. As Michael Mann states, whenever ethnic differences entwine with other social distinctions and where ethno-nationalism can capture other senses of distinctions, then the conflict becomes harder and stronger and difficult to solve. After a point, it becomes almost impossible to differentiate whether this is an economic or cultural conflict, or which one is the cause or which one is the effect. In other words, land problem as a material question, as an economic question, if you like, became an occasion to insult or humiliate the Armenian identity and faith. And the absence of the rule of law and justice created certain mentalities and perceptions on, both, and on the side of both Armenians and Muslims, including Kurds. As Stefan Asturian says, unpunished and continuous crimes against Armenians from 1850s onward made Armenians, quote unquote, fair game in the, eyes of, in the eyes of neighboring communities. These created a social setting in which violence against a target group was routinized and normalized. On the other hand, Armenians had a continuous psychology of victimhood and vulnerability. They saw themselves under a systematic attack from the state and its agents in society. Due to their collective memory shaped by the past oppressions and massacres, they regarded every single assault as made not just against Armenian individuals, but against Armenianness and their Christian identity. Even after the constitution, they couldn't completely get rid of the fear of being massacred, even after the constitution. Leaving aside the actual massacres of Adana in April 1909, one can ob observe through the Armenian press that they felt this risk of massacre, real or perceived, in also other places, in other cities of the time at the same time. However, Armenian self-image did not consist of only everlasting victimhood. They, especially intellectuals, ascribed, quote unquote, a civilizing mission to Armenian community, especially in relations with Kurds. As in examples I mentioned before show, they describe Kurds as uncivilized savages who had accustomed to living on others' labor and blood. According to this approach or thinking, Armenians could and should have assisted them in their endeavor of getting civilized. This was Armenians' responsibility, I mean, to educate Kurds, to make them civilized, uh, for the benefit of not only Kurds, but also for Armenians themselves. At the same time, however, one could come across some statements in the Armenian press of the time that, uh, that depicted Kurds as having heroic and noble characteristics. So Kurds were not only ignorant, uneducated, but at the same time, they are depicted as a noble community, a noble group of people. Uh, I'm sure some of you noticed the similarity between this discourse, I mean between Armenians' approach to Kurds 
and the Western colonialist approach and discourse that put into effect to legitimize the Western domination in colonies. Just like Europeans had ascribed themselves a civilizing mission by the phrase of, as you know, white man's burden, Armenians did so for themselves and just like Europeans had defined native people of the colonies as noble savages. Similar way, Armenians also defined Kurds as noble savages. However, of course, there were or there are some crucial differences. One is the obvious that Armenians were not outsiders in, the, in, in, in those provinces. They are the native people of, of Anatolia or the, uh, Armenia. Another crucial difference between Europeans, of course, and, and Armenians in Anatolia is that the former, the Europeans, was the absolute indis indisputable political and military power in colonies, whereas the latter, Armenians, except the very limited territories, was weak and vulnerable party in Anatolia. As a result of this political weakness, they eventually couldn't anything but complain or prepay reports giving petitions to end injustices they faced in daily life and due to land usurpations and other exploitations. The armed struggle initiated by the Armenian parties in late 1880s may have saved the lives of some Armenians, but eventually the structural problems of Armenian community, Ottoman Armenian community remained largely unsolved, as I say, even, before, even after the 1908 constitution. So Armenians civilizing discourse was not an attempt to legitimize their domination, since they did not have such a domination, but an attempt to compromise with the stronger party. For example, Turks, Kurds, Muslims, however you describe them. As they knew very well that they couldn't get rid of Kurds, they tried to formulate a way of cohabitation. And this equation, they gave themselves a moral superiority so that tried to face their honor, their faith. So they put themselves if you let me use this word, they put themselves in the white man's shoes, but indeed, they were the Indians in, in the scene, and which they would learn very soon after 1908. I don't know, do, do I have time? Two minutes and 46 seconds. Okay, then, then <laughs> briefly, briefly let me try to have some sketches about <coughs> uh, collective memory of these two communities today. Uh, let me say that what I'm going to say is, is that not a final result or conclusions. These are some observations uh, that needs to be further researched. Uh, but again, uh, let me try to have some <coughs> sketches here. Then the question is, how do Kurds and Armenians remember those days today? How do they situate each other and the genocide in their collective memory? Surely, it's not possible to talk as if those two are monolithic or homogeneous blocks. What, is, what I say about Kurds, for example, is much more related to the Kurds in Turkey, uh, of course, which is not monolithic either. I will try to refer to differences at some specific points. First of all, let me say that the collective memory of the Kurds in Turkey about the Armenian genocide is much more rich and vivid compared to the rest of the population in Turkey. Even younger generations in the Kurdish provinces know much, much more about the genocide compared to their peers in the western part of the country, as elders have relayed the stories and memories of the genocide from mouth to mouth to for decades. Moreover, abducted Armenian women and girls during the genocide who converted to Islam and continued their life as Muslims in their new families contributed to the preservation of the memories of genocide. Having an Armenian grandmother or a grand-grandmother is a very frequent among Kurdish people of Turkey. Accordingly, the recognition of the genocide and of the responsibility of Kurdish circles is much more common among Kurds, especially in the constituency of People's Democratic Party, Halkların Democratic Parties. 
those Kurds who accept the Kurdish responsibility in the Armenian genocide tend to claim that Kurds were deceived by the Ittadist regime and used as an instrument in genocide. On the other hand, there were some more conservative and rightist, let's say, Kurds, who remember and recite how Armenians massacred Kurds to establish an independent Armenia on, quote unquote, Kurdish land. Let me to be more quick. So another popular theme among the Kurds of Turkey today is that they have been paying for what they had done to Armenians. More specifically speaking, tortures, cruelties, and massacres they have experienced throughout the history of Turkish Republic are the punishment for their sins committed against Armenians. Of course, this is a popular theme, popular thinking, and I don't know, a kind of spiritual thinking maybe, as it refers to a, some kind of divine retribution. But there are also some Kurds, again, who think worldly or more worldly and say that they can infer some political lessons from what happened to Armenians since they have faced similar or even same mentality of centralist oppressive states in Turkey. Overall speaking, there are empathy and sympathy toward the image of Armenians among Kurds, especially in more, let's say, leftist circles in Turkey. Although more nationalistic and more conservative Kurds adopt a more defensive approach against Armenians and their allegations of genocide. One can say that Armenians, as long as I observe, both in Turkey and diaspora, also feel a certain sympathy to Kurds and Kurdish political movement since they regard them as the next victim of the same perpetrator. So they establish an affinity through common victimhood. On the other hand, this is also what I observe, a segment of Armenians still vividly remember and underline that Kurds were the actual killer of Armenians, the rapists of Armenian women. So they still feel enmity toward Kurds and they keep this memory fresh. In sum, as a conclusion or, uh, or in, as a summary, one can claim that each of Armenian and Kurdish categories or groups are divided into two broad fragments in itself. One segment of each is more ready to overcome or settle, uh, settle the experience and memory of the intercommunal violence and tension between two groups in the remote past and support cooperation on the basis of facing common fate at different times though. The second segment on the other hand, on the other hand prefer keeping the memory of clash and disputes of the past alive, which generates a bitter approach to other group. I think that's all as a summary of these uh, observations. So thank you for your patience. Thank you, Ohanas. This paper reminds me of a conversation I had with a young Kurd in Eastern Anatolia. He had had gotten a copy of my book on the genocide with this in, in Turkish Anjak Çölde Yaşaya Bilirler they can live in the desert but nowhere else uh, and he read the book and he said did we really do all of this? <laughs> and I said yeah you really did do all of that <laughs> so there's a kind of coming to terms which, which is part of what you were talking about yeah We move to another register, that seems to be the word today, register, uh, and that's with Hakem al Urustum, my colleague here at the University of Michigan. He also is one of this new cohort of younger scholars engaged in writing Armenian history from a wider perspective. He's an anthropologist. He's worked with diaspora Armenians on questions of identity and the vexed problem of how Armenians who survived in Eastern Anatolia, that is historic Armenia after the genocide, understood, remembered, and articulated their experiences even as what might be called their Armenianness was effaced 
by the silences that surrounded them. His work is in a very significant way grounded in social science and cultural theory and original conceptualizations. If you look at his dissertation, Anatolian Fragments, Armenians Between France and Turkey, you will see an in-depth exploration of the transmission of memory through this interesting process that he's articulated called silencing. This research is firmly located in larger issues of identity in face of official erasure of memory and displacement from the original sites of habitation. Hakem, of course, was known to us before he joined the faculty here, for he had been a Manukin fellow in that glorious academic year when Ohanes and Murat Jankara uh, were also fellows. So, Hakem, welcome back. <coughs> Thank you very much. I think this, this event is not an ordinary workshop, and that's why I, I'm going to take uh, a couple of uh, minutes to, to express uh, uh, gratitude because I'm speaking from a very privileged place to be the holder of the Manugian Chair in Modern Armenian History in the, in the presence of uh, Ron and Jirair. Uh, the two former holders of this uh, position. Uh, not only that they are uh, very insightful historians and brilliant storytellers, but they are, uh, for me, embody the, uh, the, the, the persona of the public intellectual. So I'm very honored that, that, that you are here today. And it all started, by the way, in 2010 when I got an email from Jirair. I was on a mail list uh, about uh, the Watts meeting in uh, Amsterdam in 2010. And uh, I sent an inquiry, and Ron sent me an email saying, yes, it's OK. Send me your CV and abstract. <laughs> uh, and I sent my abstract. And um, I went to that meeting, and I was introduced to you know, the brilliant scholars that are there. And when I came here in 2012 uh, as, uh, as a postdoc, suddenly I was surrounded with my walking bibliography people that I have cited and saw on Amazon. <laughs> and so uh, in, in libraries are our are, uh, are colleagues and interlocutors and, and friends. And I will always remember the way, uh, the warm welcome uh, that Catherine extended to me that year and the many uh, uh, coffee and dark chocolate I enjoyed with uh, Catherine and with Kevork as well uh, throughout that year. And uh, I was... Uh, uh, I, uh, Melanie also joined uh, the department in 2012, and it was like a life-changing experience for me. So uh, thank you very much. I'm very grateful to be here. And I thought, um, uh, and Jirair uh, reminded me yesterday uh, about uh, the things that I take so much for granted to be able to do the work I'm doing, that it has built uh, on, on the work uh, of, uh, of the scholars, mostly here at the University of Michigan, that enabled me to come and be able to, uh, to do this work. So in a way to say thank you, I'm going to, um, not going to present an ordinary workshop paper, uh, but an excerpt from my forthcoming uh, book. So uh, uh, you've read the dissertation, and now and th this is, by the way, not fresh from the oven. It is actually half cooked, but uh, <laughs> but it is. I thought it's uh, it is just right to uh, that you you are the first hearers of uh, of, of this material. On January twenty fourth, uh, two thousand and seven, I returned to Paris. It was a day after attending Herandink's funeral in Istanbul. I was pondering the funeral of the assassinated Armenian journalist. What does it mean for Turkey and Armenians when some 100,000 people march a four-mile funerary procession from Osman Bey to the Armenian cemetery in Kumkapı? With the crowds shouting, we are all Armenians, we are all Herandink in Turkish, Kurdish, and Armenian. Surely I was thinking there aren't so many Armenians in Istanbul or in all over Turkey. As Dink lied to his final rest, he awakened questions unsettling many in Turkey and in the Armenian diaspora, and an ethnographer who was trying to make sense of the event and the context. That is me. The moment of murder initiated me into the field. Reading Walter Benjamin la years later, I retrospectively interpreted Dink's 
assassination as a Benjaminian moment of danger. It brought to the surface the all-present yet latent Armenian question uh, that continues to force its entry into Turkey's present, disrupting the perception that Turkish nationalist history is a series of uninterrupted steps toward, towards progress, modernity, and civility. Throughout his writing and active engagement with the Turkish civil society, Herandink initiated discussions on Turkish Republican history as well as contemporary actuality of inclusion, diversity, and civil society of citizens, including the Kurdish question. For many, the murder was in, uh, interpreted as a continuation of the efforts to annihilate Armenians that had begun in the late Ottoman period and resulted in the killing of over a million or 1.5 million Armenians between 1915 and 1917. Ding's assassination provoked a wide-ranging ranging public debate about Turkey's Republican history pertaining to the Armenian question in Anatolia that overshadows the foundation of the Republic. This was perhaps the first time that this question has been publicly debated since the 1920s with such an urgent appeal. The assassination had an echo throughout the Armenian diaspora communities. Walking down the main street of Alfortville, a suburb of Paris where I conducted my field research, where many Armenian-owned coffee shops, restaurants, grocery stores affixed Ding's portrait on their window shops. Armenian political and cultural institutions started mobilizing an intense critique of the Turkish government, Turkish savagery, for denying uh, the systematic mass killings of Ottoman Armenians during World War I constituted genocide. To many, it was the first genocide of the 20th century. And it was, with limits, if we overpass the Congolese genocide under Belgian colonial rule, among other genocides of non-white peoples in European colonies. Dink was severely criticized by many diaspora Armenians for not advancing the cause of genocide recognition in Turkey, the way they wanted. Their position was reversed almost overnight where Armenian activists in France who criticized Dink built an anti-Turkish campaign on his assassination. They set the murder on a long timeline of events that constituted what they described as a century of Turkish violence against Armenians, viewing Dink as the 1,500,001 victim of the genocide on the posters that circulated in France uh, or at least in, in the Parisian suburbs in the first few months following the assassination. I had initially meant to study the formation of the Armenian diaspora in the aftermath of genocide in France. I was interested in migration into Europe, especially France, uh, given the ongoing debates and incidences in the country surrounding anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and the recent expulsions of Roma communities that went largely unnoticed in, in, in French media. Meanwhile, it was the prime destination of the sans-papier, the immigrant, illegal immigrants without official residency papers coming from uh, Africa. I had flown to Istanbul upon the recommendation of Krikor, who was an Istanbul Armenian who immigrated to uh, pra uh, Paris in the late 1970s, and he was one of the my main interlocutors in, in Paris. To meet Heran Dink and ask him about how he saw the role of the diaspora vis-a-vis -vis Turkey and his misgivings about the political stances of some political institutions. Ethnographic fieldwork, however, is sustained by one's initial surprises in the field. The people we meet, the words we hear, and the unplanned encounters all have a vital say in the way we see, what we trace, and who to follow. The sporadic encounters following Dink's funeral procession, and in fact, following the actual assassination, because I was some 200 meters away when he was shot that day in Istanbul, uh, have shaped my inquiry in this book. I, ha I take the knowledge that flashes up during surprising moments, unplanned events, and the accidental encounters as sources of ethnographic and historical knowledge about the Armenian past in Turkey. The survival of Armenians in Turkey was also accidental and random. Living in the shadow of catastrophe in the aftermath of violence and destruction, knowledge about Anatolian Armenians rests in silences and emerges mostly accidentally and randomly. 
Silence is not mere absence from archives and historiographies. Rather, it is also an ongoing process that continues to be reproduced in the very act of making history, as Michel Rolf Trio demonstrates in his seminal Silencing the Past. Their survival, to use Trio's description of the Haitian Revolution, is unthinkable to both Turkish and Armenian collectivities. This is partially due to the fact that this population was not meant to survive the genocide. And if they survived, they were not meant to remain in Turkey and become Turkish citizens. Such multiple accident and accidental survival is reflected in historiography, where Armenians and Turkish post-Ottoman accounts concord in obliterating the Armenians in Turkey from their respective narratives, sustaining a shared silence about them in the very act of producing the respective collective as well and some somewhat and triumphalist historiographies. By constructing a linear view of their pasts, uh, both historiographies legitimize the ethnic purity to assert the moral superiority of one group over the other. The Turkish, through the virtue of successfully establishing a mono-ethnic nation-state, and Armenians because of their victimhood at the hands of Turkish despotism and ruthless violence. Tracing the silence about Armenian survival in Turkey therefore brings to the foreground the barbaric chapters in the history, thus challenging the perceived purity of both Armenian and Turkish collective historiographies and the embedded triumphalism in both. The silences I encountered, therefore, were not merely in archives, statistics, it's tables, and historiographies. It is also in oral transmission. One encounter is worth mentioning in this context. Many of the people I met in Istanbul told me that if you are interested in an, uh, Armenians in Anatolia, you must speak with Kaspar. Of course, I changed the names here. He was born and raised in Diyarbakir and has many stories to share. I met Kaspar at his work accompanied with a common friend. After short introductions, he asked me with a pale smile, looking at his, uh, keeping his gaze on his paper on his desk, almost like this, so what do you want to know? So I said, I have a few questions about Arme how Armenians continued to live in Anatolia after 1915. So my main question is, and he abruptly stopped me saying, you know, what do you want to know? You, when you are chasing dogs or cats, after a while, you will lose track of some of them. Some are going to hide, others are going to escape. You cannot kill every single one of them. And then I said, I didn't pay attention to what he said. I said, but can I ask you specific questions about Anatolia and your experience in Diyarbakir? Of course, you, you, you realize where, where I was and where he was on completely two different levels. Um, no, you can't, he said. You can't ask. If you want to know about Armenians in Diyarbakir, read Migerdich Margusian's novels. He's from the city. He says everything in his books. You can start with Gavur Mahallesi. Kaspar was referring me to Margusian's 1992 novel named after the Armenian quarter of the city known as the Mehalle, the neighborhood where the Gavur people live. Gavur is a derogatory reference to Armenians and other Christians and Jews in Turkey derived from the Quranic word kefir, those who intentionally cover up the truth about faith. It is usually translated into English as infidel. So the novel titled a title could translate as the neighborhood where the infidels live. The novel, which I will discuss later in a different part of the book, represents one of the first eruptions of knowledge about the Armenian past in Turkey in the aftermath of the genocide, which started uh, in the early such eruptions, publications of different genre, started in the early 1990s, a couple of years uh, before uh, Dink establishes Agos. Kaspar's refusal to answer my questions was not what I expected. His straightforward and fir firm refusal surprised and frustrated me. As an ethnographer investigating the past and the aftermath of violence, I was seeking a narrative of some sort, a person, a family survival, a story with a beginning and an end that I could, that I could scribble in my field notes, analyze, theorize with fa fancy theory, and turn it into 
uh, a story to ultimately claim the triumph to have documented the unwritten history of forgotten Armenians. This, of course, taught me a lot of humility later on. But this was not the case. I had abandoned the idea of seeking orders and structures that historians and ethnographers usually seek and follow the randomness and surprises from the field. I therefore resorted to observations and asking questions the first year of the research. I relied mainly on the scattered fragments that reappear randomly through images, events, memoir that, that was published that continued to flash up, which are the main sources of knowledge in this book. It is only towards the end of my field work period that I managed to have longer conversations with people and I had uh, known for at least two years, which offer more detailed glimpses into Armenian lives in different parts of Anatolia since 1923, or to be accurate, what they retained about those years from the stories they had heard from their parents about the early Republican years and what they personally experienced in Turkey since their birth in the 1950s. Yet the silence and the unwillingness of Kaspar to speak and the few words he uttered, as frustrating encounter as it was, was a revelation. After three years of research in France and Turkey, I realized that what he said summarized the nature of knowledge that I encountered in the field, as well as a key to understand Armenian survival in Turkey. By referring to Armenian survival like that of the evading cats and dogs in the midst of the annihilation policies, Armenian survival was accidental and random. Using the metaphor of cats and dogs to refer to Armenians, he pointed to the dehumanization of Armenians during the genocide that made their annihilation possible. Indeed, in the racist language that preceded the genocide, the young Turks referred to Armenians as dogs. Furthermore, Armenian self-perception about the value of their lives, the ways in which they were killed, and patterns of survival had, in many instances, referred to dogs themselves. Finally, and most importantly, he pointed me to Margosian's autobiographical literary works, which opened a venue to collect knowledge that goes beyond uh, the ethnographic and the archival into the literary and the autobiographical to basically navigate the silences around Armenians in Republican Turkey. It is Kaspar's silence and refusal to narrate that shaped the, o that shaped the overall vision of the book. The Republic of Turkey is a nationalist project that does not shy away from being anchored in the wider European Enlightenment values of progress, modernity, and rationality that emerged out of the perceived ashes and decadence and backwardness of the Ottoman Empire. The Anatolian Armenians, the focus of this book, are therefore the civilizational trash of Turkish nationalism, which enabled the writing of Turkish history as civilized, modern, progressive, and the formation of the Republic was possible without many native communities in Anatolia and of Anatolia, especially the Armenians. In imagined communities, Benedict Anderson uses a Tom Nyron definition of nationalism where he says nationalism, quote, is the pathology of modern developmental history as inescapable as neurosis in the individual, unquote. And neurosis has been defined as a distorted way of looking at the world and oneself, determined by compulsive needs rather than genuine interest in the world. One distortion that nationalism creates, among many, of course, <laughs> has to do with the representation of the self and the other through the imagination and creation of a distinct past. The selectivity process in the nationalist historiography is created through silencing and amnesia in order to construct a national identity that is both pure, civilized, erasing what seems to be embarrassing and barbaric from the narrative. Such silences mean that discoveries of surprised knowledge could, when they are revealed, surprisingly, shake the foundation of the national and nationalist reality and order. And this is what Herant Dink did, which led to his assassination. The critical events leading to Herant Dink's assassination was 
many, and one of them was when uh, he expressed in an, in an article, he subjected the highly revered national figure, Sabiha Gökçen, to public debate when he suggested that she might have been an Armenian orphan. In an article that appeared in Agos on the 6th of February 2004, Dink spoke of the secret of the national icon and adopted daughter of Mustafa Kemal, Sabiha Gökçen. As the wor world's first female fighter pilot, Gökçen is celebrated as a symbol of both Turkish nation and Turkish women, according to the nationalist narrative. The piece was titled The Secret of Sabiha Hatun and discussed an alternative version of Gökçen's life that went counter to the publicly known official version of the story. Dink quoted Hirpsime Sibilcan, an Armenian woman from southeastern, the southeastern Anatolian city of Gaziantep, who later immigrated to Soviet Armenia, who claimed that she was Gökçen's niece. Citing Sibilcan, Dink said that Gökçen was not a Turkish orphan, but an Armenian one. This claim stirred an immediate public debate, and the Turkish daily Hurriyet discussed Dink's article promoting the office of the chief of staff of the Turkish Armed Forces to issue the following statement in response to Dink. He says, she, Gökçen, is a Turk, and the first war pilot first war pilot of the Turkish Armed Forces is an honorary member of the Turkish Air Force. Gökçen is also valuable and a strong symbol of Turkish women, and she represents Atatürk's ver vision of the ideal place of Turkish women in modern Turkish society. Opening such a figure to debate, for whatever purpose, makes no contribution to national integrity and social peace. It is unacceptable to qualify a claim which is published in an abusive discourse against national sentiments and values as newsmaking. These days, when we are in need of very strong national solidarity and the majority of our people understand the purpose of such news stories that are against our national integrity, solidarity, national values, and follow these uh, publications with concern." Unquote. The chief of staff's statement is very assertive in claiming that she is a Turk. One may think that such an asser uh, asser assertion is redundant if one equates that every citizen of Turkey is a Turk, like every American or Canadian citizen is Canadian or American, respectively. The Turkish Constitution states in Article 66 that everyone bound to the Turkish state through the bond of citizenship is a Turk. Yet this does not necessarily mean that she's a Turk in a sense that she's a native of Anatolia or the land encompassing Turkish borders. Following the publication of Dink's article, Gökçen's adopted, Gökçen's sister, quote unquote, another adopted daughter of Mustafa Kemal, asserted that Gökçen's real parents were Bosniak migrants to Turkey and thus denying her Armenianness, thus asserting her Turkishness. Such assertion, as assertive info, uh, information about her life, which is again largely unverifiable, is known and acceptable within Turkey, so what was meant by the statement that she's a Turk? Being a Bosnian parentage does not uh, contradict the fact that she is a Turk, since a Turk in the societal, historical, and political context of Turkey refers to her ethnicity and not citizenship. In other words, being a Turk means that she does not belong to any of the non-Muslim, or uh, i.e. Gavur, racial confessional communities of the Ottoman Empire. Being a Turk was a response to what Dink the Gavur, the infidel, had suggested in his Agus article that Gökçen was of Armenian parentage, and hence, despite being a Turkish citizen, she is not a Turk. The po possibility of Gökçen being an Armenian orphan opens to question the perceived purity of the Turkish nation, the fact that the possibility of Gökçen might have been an Armenian orphan raises questions about the foundational violence of the Turkish Republic, the massacres, deportations, and genocide. And thus, it, it is an attempt to bring the silenced barbaric chapters to Turkish history that Dink was attempting to do. 
Writing oppositional history is in itself a critique of nationalism that is sustained through silences and systematic efforts of reproducing amnesia within and between populations in the post-imperial nation-state order. Ignoring such dark sides of democracy, here I'm invoking Michael Mann, uh, a modernist historian forges a document of civilization for the nation state by pushing the barbarism of nationalisms under the rug of civilized historiography. This book is neither an attempt to write a corrective history nor represent silenced individuals or events. Rather, by taking the Armenian citizens of Turkey as an example, it aims at compiling the wreckages of barbarism and the trash of missions that claim civilization and progress uh, at its core, which furnish the ideological foundation of the modern nation state. I'll stop here. Thank you. Well, thank both of our speakers for their work and for their excellent presentations. Just a few remarks because we don't have that much time. We'll go to what? Uh, uh, 2.35. Okay. Uh, so, these, both of these papers, I think, do real service to uh, the way in which documents and even silences can be read. I'm going to start with a comment on Ohannes's paper. And as I read the paper, I couldn't help but think about a recent documentary that I saw on PBS. I usually stop working around 10 o'clock at night, and I watch some TV. It could be you know, Samantha B, or uh, it could be a PBS documentary. In this case, it was uh, the documentary that uh, had been produced on the Reconstruction period in the United States. So post-Civil War, slaves have been emancipated. They've been promised 40 acres and a mule. And the US federal government is ready to support the enfranchisement and the material sustenance of this liberated African-American population. Until the 1870s, when there's so much resistance from the South that a deal is made and the government withdraws. It takes away its support and the, the Southern aristocracies in some kind of crude alliance with the middle and lower cl white classes uh, takes over institutes Jim Crow, in, uh, um, enforces it through the most brutal violence you can imagine, murders, assassinations, lynching, etc., and that lasts right up to the 1960s, right? Now, there was a deep structural problem. Even though the South had been defeated in the Civil War, it needed the state to correct the social injustices that the enslaved people had endured. And think about this historical analogy. Now, no historical analogy is exact. In fact, you could say historical analogies are the weakest form of historical logic, right? Everything is Nuremberg, and everybody is Hitler, including Trump, right? My view is the John Stewart view that the only thing we should call Hitler is Hitler. But what do we do with this analogy? Because it seems to me it does illustrate, for a good historical sociologist like Ohannes, a particular conjuncture, a particular moment when without state intervention, without a genuine, authentic, and sincere effort by the state to correct a deep social problem, the victims are left uh, defenseless. That they have no leverage, they have no way to restore the status quo ante. Um, and the Young Turk Revolution begins, as Ohannes mentioned, with enormous promise. They believe in this thing called the Constitution. Uh, and they think the Constitution will solve all of their problems. But the big material problem, the big structural problem, is the land. It's not a fungible commodity. It's often limited, except in Russia, where they can always go to Siberia. Uh, and conflict over the land as nomadic peoples are settling down, as populations are increasing, as many Armenians are leaving the land to migrate because of the, the repressions by Turks and Kurds, um, there seems to be something that, that, that is almost insoluble. 
uh, and becomes more insoluble precisely because uh, the, the, the state has withdrawn. Much of Ottoman history, it seems to me, like modern Turkish history, uh, Republican history, is a problem based in the thing is, is too much government a problem or too little government mm. a problem? And here's a case in which too little intervention by the government was a problem. And so what resulted? Well, in America, Jim Crow, lynching. In the case of the, the Turkish uh, Empire, the Ottoman Empire, it was genocide. I like your structure. I like your paper very much. I, I, but I'll do what a historian does, right? Uh, political scientists and sometimes sociologists, not you, uh, prefer, instead of complexity, parsimony. They want simplicity. They want a direct answer. I'm going to argue for more complexity because it seems to me in my own work on, on the genocide and the pre-genocide period, I was struck by how many times, uh, even right up to 1914, the Turkish state, the young Turks, who were about to murder hundreds of thousands of Armenians, actually allied with Armenians mm -hmm. against Kurds. Mm -hmm. Not enough, mm -hmm. and ultimately they didn't enforce the program that they set out to do. But you mentioned the case of Esad Efendi, mm -hmm. where they arrest the guy for faking uh, this, this uh, deal. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I remember in my own work, a joint military campaign, imagine, at 13 or 14, that is already when the radicals are in control, uh, of Armenians and Turks against Kurds. Mm -hmm. So you got a complex situation out there in Eastern Anatolia. Tribe, different tribes, different kinds of local situations, mm -hmm. and occasionally the state did work mm -hmm. with the Armenians against Turds, the Kurds, though of course very often they did the opposite as well. One of the most powerful points in uh, uh, Ohanis' paper is this idea of civilizational hierarchy, that is, People believe in social historical evolution. Some peoples were superior to others. Some were further advanced along the social evolutionary scale. And Armenians, not only Armenians, but Armenians, uh, many young Turks, and Kurds themselves internalized an idea that Armenians were more civilized than those other people, right? And in general, settled peoples were always thought to be more uh, 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 advanced than nomads, even though. Kurds were, were very largely uh, settling in, in this period. And I remember one incident around the time of the European interest in a, uh, in a reform that was going to be imposed by the great powers in order to prevent the, the destruction of the, of the Ottoman Empire. They were going to give autonomy under European inspectors to eastern Anatolia. And Armenian leaders at that point, we're talking right on the eve of the war, said, yes, we want that autonomy. But by the way, don't give it to the Kurds. <laughs> they are not ready for this kind of thing. So even there, you see the civilizational hierarchy sounds really uh, liberal that we're going to educate the Kurds. We need to help them along. But at the same time, they're not quite like us. And you beautifully show how there's an imperial colonialist aspect to this Armenian uh, 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 discourse. And by the way, Kurdish attitudes internalize the same hierarchical difference. And even today, I think, in current Kurdish uh, um, uh, discourse, you can hear instances of this. There used to be here an orchard. When the Armenians were here, they were growing vegetables, apricots. And we came along, and we destroyed it. They have put the same thing on the, on the, on the table again. So these things are deeply uh, internalized kinds of things. One of the powers of, of uh, Ohanis' sociological approach is that the structures are so compelling that you can have the best will in the world, but these problems are deeply, deeply uh, difficult and maybe insoluble, right? Uh, and I thought that was one of the powers of the paper. So I don't know if I'm asking you a question or whether these are some of the things you might, yeah, yeah. might think about. On Huckham's paper, um, this is a wonderful idea of using this idea of silences, right? And it's amazing how you can get things out of that, since the, the story is largely about absences rather than presences. But I do want to take one little quibble uh, with one sentence you said. You said uh, that Benedict Anderson uses Tom Nairn's definition of nationalism as a kind of pathology, as a kind of neurosis. Uh, neurosis. Um, actually, 
in the text, he doesn't do that. He mentions it, but the, 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 the argument is against that view because the debate of that early part of, of imagined communities is between Marxists. And, and then it enters as a Marxist. But he's a Marxist who's already saying we have got to take culture and other things seriously. And among those things, we have to realize that nationalism has positive aspects. Much of the, of the prehistory uh, of the national studies before Anderson was negative, Marxist studies, negative about nationalism. Aaron was, Aaron was an exception. He's a Scottish nationalist, but he still saw it as pathological. Uh, as a fellow Marxist then, uh, Anderson is critical of Marxists who, even though sympathetic to nationalism, consider it to be some kind of pathology. And he wants us to take nationalism much more seriously and recognize its positive contributions. Personally, I'm closer to Nairn and Hakim <laughs> thinking that, that there's something pathologically uh, neurotic about nationalism. I find it mostly harmful, but we can think of anti-colonialist nationalisms that play positive roles until they take power, and then it's a disaster, right? Uh, okay, uh, and Anderson is making this important thing that we need as scholars to look a little bit with a little less hostility into the origins and spread of nationalism. Hakim makes this beautiful and sensitive point, and I, I can't imagine what it was like to be in Istanbul, so close to Haran's murder, and then to participate in the parade, in the, the funeral uh, commemoration, etc. That was an earthquake moment, right? It changed everything for a while, maybe until Gezi, maybe until uh, the coup when, when things went the other way more. But there was this opening, and we all benefited from that opening. Watts benefited from it, uh, the, the scholarship uh, Turks and Kurds and others coming to the United States to study these complex issues, uh, 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 including the genocide. Harant Dink, I'll finish with this, was murdered after being found guilty of insulting Turkishness. But I wonder what you think, Hakim, you probably will agree, we'll see, that the real insult here is not Dink's, but it's the Turkish state's notion that there's such an essence as Turkishness, which in fact denies the very variety, diversity, complexity, the history of mixing of peoples and cultures that have made up and still constitute this people who imagine that they're Turks in whatever sense, civic or ethnic. The fact is that Sabah Algecen was a Turk. She was a Turk, but she was also an Armenian, or a Bosniak, or something else. And it's right in that hybridity, that pull be so, between some bizarre idea of blood or genes, and on the other side, culture, that some notion of Turkishness has to reside. So let's have a little bit of time for some questions to our colleagues, and then we'll let them respond. So I'll collect the questions, all right? Lois first, and then Karen. nation about the hidden Armenians of Turkey. Um, I found this to be a very, very powerful book about all of these people in Eastern Anatolia about whom I had no idea at all. And I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, how your work you know, intersects with that because it sounds like you might have talked to some of the same people in Istanbul and then he went all over Eastern Anatolia interviewing people and one of the most striking things was about how the government of D.R. Becker helped rebuild the Armenian church and how you have these Muslim Armenians and Christian Armenians <laughs> going to worship together in this church. I mean, this is all stuff, you know, that I found to be quite revolutionary. So I'd be interested in hearing your views on that. Thank you. Got it. First, thank the presenters and uh, Professor Sunni for uh, for his commentary. Uh, I, w I have a specific question. I hope uh, I'm asking a specific question to Ohanes, hoping that it might be productive. Towards the end, you kind of 
talked about responsibility and instrumentalization. So to, in my mind, they're, it, they're formed to some sort of a dichotomy or even an opposition between them. Uh, if, if someone says I was in, or my community in the past was instrumentalized, then it's one way of saying we're not responsible, mm. but then it's a form of taking responsibility. So I was wondering if we can think about that and maybe go beyond this contradiction, or what are the boundaries of this contradiction? That's my specific question. Thank you. We have so little time, but anyone else before I surrender to our speakers? Okay. Mohanan. Of course, this question can be answered very long, but very briefly, let me say that in my opinion, in my view, their argument that Kurds had been used by centralist government today is a way of saving their face, saving uh, their uh, position against all these allegations, uh, especially for recent years, because in Turkey there has been a tendency, especially by, again, official circles, to burden genocide on the shoulders of Kurdish people, saying that indeed centralist government did not have such kind of intention of mass anni annihilation, but all these Kurdish tribes, Kurdish savages did all these massacres, etc. So these Kurdish circles I'm talking about try to find a way, both accepting their responsibility, but also facing this accusation coming from this Turkish official uh, circle. So it's this instrumentalist approach for, uh, among Kurds is a way of balancing these two things. They do not deny genocide, but they also didn't want to accept that it was their plan, it was their organization, it was their plot. So this instrumentalization so is a middle way to, to both face all, all these arguments. Thank you very much, uh, Ron, for very generous uh, comments about about the paper and for the comment on uh, on on Anderson. I just want to address uh, the point you mentioned at the very end uh, about the the, the the issue is not uh, insulting Turkishness, but the very notion of Turkishness itself. And this is something that I treat in another paper, uh, thinking through Edward Said uh, uh, Orientalism where in most of the time we think th about um, the discourse of Orientalism as representing otherness. But Said also tells us that the representation of the other happens at the same time in the same discourse as representing the self. Most of the time, the, the idea of, uh, the, idea of uh, the Orientalist discourse is a historical discourse. It is built on philology doesn't take history and change into account. Mm -hmm. Everything is in closed boxes. So the, the inferior other, uh, whether the, 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 the Kurd or, 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 or the Arab for, for, for the Ottomans and so on, uh, freezes the, the history of the other, but at the same time freezes the, the history of the self. So then nationalist historiography, in that sense, I mean, we can read nationalist historiography as deeply orientalist in a way that it has an, an, an ahistorical um, and, uh, um, image of the self, and it's based on essences that exist from time immemorial. You know, the Turkish nation is a nation of soldiers. Everyone is a soldier, uh, and, and, and the rest of it. So, so this, is, this is, of course, I think I... Uh, is a very in, important point to focus on that th the issue is not with Dink said, but the issue is in the actual nationalist mm -hmm. perception that Dink was trying to, uh, to, to um, critique. Now, about uh, the, the Hadjian's book and other genre, now I dedicate actually a chapter in the book about the knowledge that emerges uh, about Armenians in Turkey since 1990. And I don't want to go into the reasons, but the 19, 1990, 1991 was a turning point in Turkey, not only because of the liberalization that happened since the 1980 coup leading into Turkey, but also because of the independence uh, of, uh, of uh, the Republic of, uh, of, of Armenia. Uh, that changed the, the matrix of debating the Armenian, uh, Armenian question. But how my work is different, I don't try, as I said, I don't try to narrate the unwritten stories in the positive sense, but I try to depict absences. So I'm, I'm not filling the gaps, but, but trying to um, 
uh, map the negative or doing, doing the opposite of what a, a, a historians would like usually, usually do. So I, I'm just looking at how absent Armenians are, not what happened to Armenians. So even when I na narrate a story, I narrate it in a way in order to see what, what, what is missing in, in the written records and not, uh, that's why I, I abandoned, after meeting Kaspar, I abandoned the idea of I'm going to write the history, the unwritten history of Armenians. No, I'm, I'm going to write the silence around the unwritten history and the written uh, history about Armenians. Is that, does it make sense? Well, let's thank our presenters for this wonderful environment.